And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ask the Professors, Governor State <laughs> University uh, 2020 Election Edition. Thanks to everyone who is participating, especially my fellow panelists. <clears throat> and we hope to have uh, an interesting uh, hour or two for you of questions from members of the Governor State University community. But let's begin with a, an official legal disclaimer from <laughs> Bill Cressy, um, LD or JD. JD, that's what you are. JD, JD, <laughs> MS, and all those things, CPA. Uh, yes. Please note, the Illinois Ethics Act, 5 ILCS 430-1, prohibits certain political activities by state employees during working hours or on state property. This Ask the Professors event does not violate the Ethics Act because of the definition of political located at 5 ILCS 430-1-5. Political means any activity in support of or in connection with any campaign for elective office or any political organization, but does not include activities that are otherwise in furtherance of the person's official state duties or governmental and public service functions. As long as the panelists or any other GSU employees involved in Ask the Professors do not speak in support of or in connection with any political party, candidate, referendum issue, etc., the participants should not be in violation of the Illinois Ethics Act. Comments discussing the issues surrounding the upcoming election should be viewed as consistent with the professor's educational mission, that is, otherwise in furtherance of the person's official state duties or public service functions. Thus, this event's motto should be educate, not advocate. Additionally, the comments of each participant are their own and does not necessarily reflect the positions of Governor State University or any of the other participants. Still there. Thank you, Bill. You're and um, the panelists who have graciously agreed to give of their time um, this afternoon uh, are not, we haven't actually prepared any sort of opening remarks. We're just here ready to take questions. But I would like to just go around the room and let everyone very briefly introduce themselves to the community because not all of our students and staff and other, other attendees may know all of us. So I'm Dave Golland, um, Professor of History and President of the Faculty Senate. Uh, Elliot, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Elliot Fackler. I'm an Assistant Professor of History uh, and I also teach first year seminar. Thank you. Uh, Jim? My name is Jim Vining. I'm an assistant professor of communication studies at Governor State. Uh, my research areas focus on uh, political communication and social movement rhetoric. Thank you. Uh, Don. I'm Don Culverson, a faculty member in the departments of <laughs> politics and social justice studies, political science, and public administration. Thank you. Uh, Bill? And I am Bill Cressy. I am a professor in the College of Business, where I concentrate in accounting, but auditing and my specialty fraud examination. Uh, I am also one of the three commissioners of the Chicago Board of Election Commissioners, and I am known lovingly as Professor Fraud. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, Mary. Hi, I'm Professor Mary Bruce. And I am in the Department of Public Administration, also a coordinator for nonprofit and social entrepreneurship. And uh, I teach American government. I'm a political scientist, uh, graduated from Wayne State University. Awesome, thank you. Let's jump right in. Uh, the very first question that we received by email echoes a question that we just got in the Q&A. Which, uh, and by the way, for those of you who submitted questions, um, I'm gonna assume you don't want me to share your name, so I'm just gonna read your question, uh, if that's okay. So this first question is, why do we have the Electoral College and why do we use it over the majority vote? Panelists? Okay, well, the lawyer will start. Um, <laughs> uh, it goes back to our, our founding. Um, and the idea that um, the federal government 
of the United States is a federal government, not a uh, central government, where the states are, um, you know, departments. Uh, rather, the states are sovereign states, and the federal government is a government of limited enumerated powers. Uh, thus, the president of the federal government is elected uh, by the sovereign states, uh, not so much popularly by the, the citizens of the entire country. Uh, so that's why this electoral uh, college uh, system was created was from that perspective of being a federal government uh, and sovereign states. Thank you, Bill. I saw Elliot was trying to get in there as well. Did you have something to add, Elliot? I, I think Bill summed it up absolutely perfectly. Um, what I always tell my students is to think about um, the early American Republic, people would have often said these United States rather than the United States, which kind of charts um, an evolution in the way that we think about the relationship between uh, the individual states and the federal government over time. But certainly it was these United States at the founding. And that, that begs the question, uh, because we're distinguishing between a time 210 to 230 years ago, where we spoke of the states, the United States as a plural, versus today where we tend to think of the United States as a singular. Has the Electoral College outlived its usefulness for this republic? You're all afraid of violating the Ethics Act? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, I think um, there would be those who would say, Yes. Um, however, those who are citizens of the less populous states would say uh, no. Otherwise, you would have a situation where presidents would be elected uh, by New York and California and maybe a few more, but that would be it. Uh, so in order to have a president to be viewed as uh, one elected by the whole country, um, I think the, uh, the argument would be the Electoral College is still valuable and it's up to the candidates to make themselves popular to the entire country and not just, you know, a couple of places where they can pick up a lot of votes. Countervailing view? Because I like the way Bill started that with some people say, right? So what do some other people say? I'm, I'm not violating the Ethics Act if I say it that way. <laughs> right. Can someone make an argument for, for abolishing the Electoral College? So a countervailing argument would be that um, the, uh, the votes, the electoral votes that each individual citizen is represented by in a state like Wyoming is much greater um, than citizens in a state like California. Um, and so uh, those people who seek to see the United States as a radical democracy um, tend to balk at the continued existence of the Electoral College and they point to um, the elections of 2000 and 2016 in which the candidates who won the popular vote did not uh, get the presidency. Jim, Don, Mary, want to get in on this topic? I guess I think that one of the things we have to keep in mind is that uh, who the founding fathers were and what some of their interests were. Certainly part of their fears were that the masses would take over. I mean, that they, they really, you know, put in these kind of controls so that that wouldn't happen. And certainly the Electoral College reflects that. But also let's keep in mind, that, again, I think that there's a, there's a popular rhetoric I and mean, there's a rhetoric about the, you know, the importance of the popular, uh, uh, the people. You know, I think our democratic rhetoric has gotten far ahead of our uh, re uh, representative realities. And I think uh, part of the problem that we have is that not very many people know much about our government. Uh, I think that we have some ideas about that, but we really don't have an understanding of it. I mean, and that's, and many times uh, people who are representatives of government don't have an understanding of that. And so I think part of it, it, the misunderstanding about the Electoral College is that, you know, most people don't understand, you know, what it is and how it operates.
I um another another case um, that is often made for um, things such as the uh, electoral college is that um, uh, it's a bit of a safeguard to um, or some would call it a safeguard to protect from um, uh, say someone garnering uh, in in other in history there's um, you know examples of of authoritarian um, leaders gaining popular appeal. And um, so the, the electoral college would be a bit of a safeguard to uh, protect, or protect um, that from, from happening. Um, now, certainly there are others who say, okay, that may have been the case, but um, they would point to certain instances and say, uh, you know, it hasn't done its job, um, would be a bit of a counter argument to that, so it is, but it is interesting. I mean, we've been to, to think about, um, you know, is, is, um, we, we love the idea of, of democracy. We've also, we've also been in group projects in our classes, right? Where um, the majority opinion isn't always the best one or the one that gets us the best grade. So um, sh should there be, uh, should there be people with expertise in government who, who actually cast the vote uh, in the electoral college? It's kind of the, the counter argument, not advocating for either one, but I think there is some, some things to consider there. And I, I thought Mary was trying to get in, but she was muted. Yes, I wanted to chime in and say something sort of uh, related to what uh, Dr. Culverson was saying. Uh, civic engagement came to mind when you were talking about um, how so many people might not fully understand how government works, how the political processes work, even those that sometimes are elected to serve in a representative uh, capacity. And it, it, it was the opportunity that I wanted to take to encourage listeners to, to ask ourselves, are we civically engaged in our communities? Do we attend village board meetings? As I stated, I, I teach particularly in the public administration area, particularly during this time of COVID and with all of the uprising that we've been experiencing in this country, I think we have been given a specific uh, challenge and opportunity as individuals to ask ourselves, is this the opportunity where I might want to learn more about how government works? And I'm glad to see the question about the Electoral College. You know, do I want to take time and maybe even YouTube a lesson on how the Electoral College works? Uh, what, it's so many ways that as citizens, we can educate ourselves today with the internet, with the ability to reach out to universities, to uh, use libraries. So I'm just, I just want to put civic engagement uh, out there on the table as we discuss the this election and as we discuss how what are the different ways of participating even if you're under 18 years old how people can participate in the political process and have an active voice it doesn't matter if you're a senior or if you are you know a, a young child going to the polls to vote with your parents so that you can start thinking about the importance of voting very early. I think that's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Mary. You know, we've, we've got a couple of other questions that uh, have kind of touched on this same topic. Uh, one of them is asking, what is the fate of the Electoral College? And in fact, it does not require an, a, a constitutional amendment to get rid of it. Uh, there is a movement among the states to change their own election laws that, uh, so that the state's electors would be casting their ballots for whoever wins the popular vote. And those laws will only go into effect when enough states have those laws that it would actually result in a majority uh, of, of the electoral college going that way. Um, I would also add um, that part of the problem that is being discussed now in the media with regards to the Electoral College is connected to another question that, is, that, is, that we're being asked to talk about, 
which is the fate of the Supreme Court. Um, at this point, at where, where we stand right now, um, we, have the, uh, we have a situation where the United States Senate um, is underrepresentative of the American people. So it's similar to the Electoral College in that sense. It represents the states rather than the people. And we have a president who was elected by the Electoral College without winning a popular vote majority. And that president has appointed with the consent and, uh, and advice of that Senate, three of the nine current justices of the Supreme Court. And I think that those people who talk about um, democracy uh, are very concerned about that sort of a trend. I think the founders wanted to ensure that minority uh, opinions were protected, but I, I'm not sure, and Elliot could perhaps help me out on that because that's his special, his specialist area. I'm not sure the, the founders were looking for specifically minority rule, or were they? <laughs> that's a good question. I think that's an open question for, um, for scholarly interpretation. I'm no legal historian. Um, my sense is that uh, there is fear of both tyranny of majority, but also tyranny of minority um, among the founders. They did create a pretty elegant, though flawed system of government. Um, it, I think the, the, one of the questions that we received in advance um, mentioned that uh, the, um, the appointment of Amy Coney Barrett was uh, illegal, I think it said in parentheses. Um, and just to be clear, there was no, nothing illegal about the way that she has been appointed. Um, the Senate followed procedure. Um, but perhaps what this does indicate is that um, the Senate in doing very different things with Merrick Garland and Amy Coney Barrett four years later is willing to play a, um, a a hardball game, right? A political hardball game. And so there's a movement, I think, among um, many Democrats to, um, to do the same thing. Should uh, Biden win the White House and should a uh, Democratic Senate um, end up in place either in 2020 or uh, in the next couple of years, right? There would be nothing that would constitutionally stop um, a Democratic Senate um, and a Democratic president from um, changing the Supreme Court, adding four justices to uh, reflect the 13 um, courts of appeals across the United States, and then stacking them with people who are in favor of um, the policies of uh, the Democratic Senate majority. I was hoping you'd talk a little about slavery too, uh, <laughs> since that's a, that's a definitely a U.S. Part One uh, issue. But it, it, I think it does speak to um, the people who created the Electoral College uh, and the reason why um, African Americans were counted as three fifths um, was about giving greater political power to the slaveholding uh, states and especially the the elites, uh, the wealthy planter class in the slaveholding states. Uh, and if you look at who was elected president up until, uh, well, let's say for the first 60 years of the American presidency, only three presidents were non-slaveholders and each of them only had a one-term uh, uh, time in office. Um, you look at the long-term presidents of the early republic, these are all big planters, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Jackson, right, um, Taylor. So. Uh, it is definitely stacked in that direction at that point, uh, and um, and it remains uh, in a sense. Um, but let's that's, um, uh, actually, David, I'm going to I'm going to uh, dispute that, and that the three fifths was actually a way of um, diluting power from the South, because some of the original plans was that slaves would be counted as you know, in the populations, and thus the South would have greater representation in the House of Representatives than the North would. 
and that by shifting it the other way, by putting the three fifths, it would give the uh, the North at least parity with the South. Well, that's technically true that the North wanted the slaves not to count at all, and the Southern planter class wanted all of the slaves to count fully. But let's not forget that the slaves were not enfranchised, that they were not actually, they did not have the power to vote. Um, and so uh, when we hear arguments today about whether the census should count undocumented immigrants as being part of a population of a state, which directly contributes to how many members of Congress there are from that state and how many electoral votes there are from that state. Um, it's an interesting argument because often um, it's not historically grounded in that, in what you and I were just talking about. How about uh, this question? Um, is it possible with a new Trump Supreme Court nomination that Roe versus Wade can be overturned? Okay, the lawyer's going to speak up again. Uh, a lawyer who also worked as a law clerk at the federal courts here in Chicago. Um, first of all, I, I, I always, you know, cringe when I hear, you know, the Trump Supreme Court. Historically, we have a lot of uh, uh, cases where, uh, just let that ring, where uh, justices have been uh, uh, put on the court by a president and then surprises them with their with their rulings, okay? The, the current Chief Justice has been criticized for that. Uh, but uh, theoretically, yes. Uh, however, the, a, a case has to first get up to the Supreme Court. The Constitution only allows the Supreme Court to rule on cases and controversies. It cannot simply say, oh, by the way, and now we wanna go back and, and, and uh, you know, change Roe versus Wade. First, there has to be a case to get up there. They have to argue the matter uh, and um, and and go from there. So it's 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 certainly not a a sure thing. Uh, theoretically, yes, it can happen, but it's it's not going to happen right away. And there's a lot of things that can happen in the meantime. Plus, even if Roe, when you say overturned, it would state that uh, it's no longer a constitutional right. Then it falls back to what we had before Roe, which was leaving it up to each of the states to decide for themselves. The federal government could step in as well. Uh, so um, a, a lot can happen. It's, it's not that cut and dry. I think just to add to what Bill said, just uh, to give some sense of the numbers, Bill's absolutely right that we don't necessarily know if any individual justice is going to um, rule uh, on cases in the way that the president who appointed them wishes they would. Um, but just to give some sense of the numbers, um, I looked this up this morning, 39% of federal judges uh, that are currently um, presiding are uh, Obama appointees, 24% are Trump appointees. So the any, any Supreme Court case um, would have to go through the right uh, district and appellate courts to even make it to the Supreme Court, right? Um, so that, that's one thing to consider. And then there's also the numbers that we see. Um, I think the research by um, both news organizations like NBC, but also um, think tanks like Pew indicate that somewhere between 60 and 66 percent of Americans um, support Roe v. Wade, right? So, so even with a Supreme Court ruling, if the ultimate decision gets kicked back to the states, you, we're not going to see um, the clock turned back to, you know, pre-1970s United States, not anytime soon anyway. I think James raised a, a really, I mean, Elliot raised an interesting point about um, kind of like the, the culture of both those in government as well as the population as a whole. I mean, thinking back to something Mary said about uh, civic engagement. So civic engagement is sort of part of a larger culture that we have toward our own system. Uh, and I think that certainly uh, when we think about changes in government, it's important to think about the cultures of various 
cohorts or divisions of, gov of government. Elliot mentioned, again, I think very well, uh, uh, it addresses the point of how uh, he said that, uh, what it was, 39% uh, of the federal judges were appointed by Obama and 24% by Trump. And so again, we can assume that those people are, yeah, they were appointed by a particular president, but they're not necessarily